Um, thank you so much for coming, Kathy, and obviously Anea. We're so pleased to have you and so um, excited that you're coming to speak to our students and the many guests who have registered. Um, so there's no person better, I think, to introduce you in this context than Kathy. So please take it away, Kathy. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. That's very nice of you. Um, so welcome all and welcome visitors. Can you hear me okay? Just nod your head, Annie, if I'm coming through loud and clear. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> okay, so it really gives me great pleasure to welcome Inaya Lockwood back to LCC. And I guess it is one of the great mercies for a horrible lockdown. Um, but it's also great to be uh, welcoming Anaya on this day, which is really kind of the first or second day of the new order in the USA. So a few small positivities at the moment. Um, I know it's quite early in the morning for Anaya, so I'm really thankful that you can join us in your morning. So Anaya has been exploring and innovating with and through sound for the last five decades. Her compositions range from sound art and environmental sound installations, including various piano transplants from the 1960s and 1970s, and there's a wonderful interview with Irene Revel online about these, to concert music. Originally from New Zealand, Anea was part of a vibrant experimental scene in London in the 1970s, before moving to the USA, where she has been settled ever since. And her work is marked by collaboration political engagement and a singular intense investigation of material and source as manifested in the glass concerts first performed in London in the 1960s and the groundbreaking and inspirational sound maps particularly the first one of the Hudson River released by Lovely Music in 1989 and which traces the course of the Hudson through on-site recordings of its flow at 15 separate locations. As Louise Gray, or Louise Marshall, as she's also known, has written, and I quote, it's in this sonic shapeability of an essentially dynamic material, sound itself, that the key to her work lies. It unites not only the early childhood memories of sound that Lockwood has often spoken of, the stream sounds and calls of kiwis and other birds up in the mountains of her natal New Zealand, to her mature compositional work, but also links to the translations of energy that's represented in the piano transplants, the flows of the river sound maps, or is, re or, or is revealed sounds far off natural phenomena that we hear and will hear in wild energy. Her compositions eagerly embrace the central paradox that sound shaping presents, that sound and music are insubstantial and yet their waveforms can be altered. Sound is always heard in its sensuousness rather than a materiality. So recent work include Becoming Air, co-composed with Nate Woolley, Wild Energy with Bob Bielecki, a site-specific installation focused on geophysical, atmospheric and mammalian infra and ultra sound sources um, and permanently installed at the Caramore Centre for Music and the Arts, Katona, New York and Into the Vanishing Point, co-composed with the ensemble Yarn Wire, a meditation on the large-scale disappearance of insect populations. Um, and finally, I want to say that Amenea is the recipient of the Seamus Society for Electroacoustic Music in the United States Lifetime Award of 2020. And let's hope she'll be getting a lot more awards in the near future. Thank you very much for joining us, Amenea. It's great to see you. I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that most generous introduction and comprehensive. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see you again. Lovely to be with you all. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Go, very much for inviting me to talk today. I've been looking forward to, I am very much looking forward to your questions and comments at the end of my talk. Uh, I've been a composer all my life since I was a teenager and as Kathy referenced I've made works for instrumentalists and singers, sound installations and electroacoustic works, most recently the collaborations which you mentioned. 
those are collaborations with though, that with Nate Woolley, becoming heir, the trumpet player and composer, and with the piano percussion quartet, Jan Weir. These are collaborations with five very exciting musicians, wonderful to work with. And this past year, I've been working on an electroacoustic piece for the Counterflows Festival this April. So my medium, as it were, varies. Composing, working with sound, has long been how I learn about the world, about phenomena such as volcanic vents and rivers, about connection with the non-human world, and about collaboration with other humans. It is exploration. And a guideline for me has often been, of several possible ideas, choose the most extreme. That one will stimulate the deepest exploration and take me furthest from my familiar practices. At the heart of much of my work is a fascination with the interior details of a sound, how its energy unfolds, affecting its partials and their shifting balances, which has been true ever since I started working with single sound sources in my glass concerts in the 60s as Kathy mentioned, while I was living in London. Experimenting with many types of glass from Pilkington's factories, I would feel a direct tactile connection to the glass, a sensitivity to the energy in the material as it built or changed. And at a certain point, the glass would, as it were, take charge. And the unpredictability of the sounds which would emerge was fascinating. It felt more like collaboration than performance and was always exciting. And I'd like to mention that that same sense of the unpredictability of where a sound will go was something which drew Nate and myself, Nate Woolley and myself together very early in our collaboration um, and became a core aspect of, of our piece together, Becoming Air. I love that. I love it about rivers. I can never predict exactly how their sounds will change. So, Michael, could you bring up the first image, please? Thanks. Okay, here I'm holding a small sheet of microglass. It's about four inches by eight inches, maybe. Um, microglass is, some, is, is the substance from which electromicroscopy slides are made, and it's very thin. I'm holding it loosely with the tips of my fingers to get maximum resonance, and I'm shaking it very close to the mic. In, in the concert, actually, I'm off stage, um, and I'm shaking it in front of the mic, really because the closer I get to the mic, the more the low frequencies emerge, uh, low enough to be really surprising in such a, such a small piece of material. It's very supple, flexes like paper. So as you listen to the microglass shake, the first sound file in your Dropbox collection. As you listen to it, imagine yourself sitting in a totally dark theater, even the exit lights off, so that your ears are your primary sense. This is the sound with which I would open the glass concerts.
the next sound vibrating plane pain um, was created from a, a large pane of wired glass. It was about six foot by six foot. I mean, it was really big. Wired glass um, is made from two sheets of glass uh, between which is sandwiched um, wire mesh. Um, it had, the sheet had a, one rough surface and I'm stroking it with a candle. The candle's firm enough to get the pain resonating but without the brittle sounds that a mallet would create. And on stage, it's an on stage sound backlit, the lines that the candle forms on the pane are really nice to watch as they accumulate. I don't have an image for you. Um, perhaps you can imagine it. I'm playing with speed, direction, location, and pressure. Listen for sounds in the mid range. There the pane really sings. This interest in the interior details of sounds underlies my three sound maps of rivers, the Hudson, the Danube, and the Housatonic, but also instrumental works such as a prepared piano piece, Ear Walking Woman. And it pulled me towards environmental sound early on. We're so lucky that we're living in a time in which we can extend our ears through microphones, pick up audio tech generally with greater and greater sensitivity. This is really an important expansion of our sensitivity to the non-human environment at a time when reducing our impact on it is crucial. And the medium, sound, is a powerful channel. I experience it as a channel of connection between me and the trees in my backyard, for instance, and thus between me and their root systems and extending it a little further, the fungi with which the roots are symbiotic. Sound vibrations enter us fast and directly on many levels through bone conduction, cavities and liquids, affecting blood sugar levels, blood pressure, respiration, pulse rates, muscle tension. So the upside of the fact that we have no physical defenses against sound is that we can feel deeply permeated by it, immersed in it. I often experience sound strongly in my body, so it brings me a visceral sense of connection to whatever I'm listening to. And that may be true for many of us. The nexus of environment, body and sound is something I've been working on for a long time. And I see these as inseparable aspects of the flow of all sorts of energy. Sound is one of the channels through which as humans, we sense the energy of other phenomena and release our own. So as it flows through us, affecting us physiologically and emotionally, 
a conduit of connection is formed with a hydrothermal vent, for example, or a beam, an experience of non-separation, the underlying reality. It can be a fleeting recognition, but it returns and is exhilarating, and I find grounding and nourishing, ground under one's feet, something we need so much in these really troubled times, comfort. This is the core of Wild Energy, a sound installation which Bob Balecki and I created in 2014 for the Caramore Center for the Arts, Katona, New York. Balecki may be known to you through his many years of work with Laurie Anderson, Stephen Vitiello, and Lamont Young, many other artists. He's a superb sound designer and inventor and is currently carrying out research in psychoacoustics and 3D audio arrays. In 2013, the composer Stefan Moore, who was curating an ex exhibition of 14 site-specific sound installations for Caramore, a new venture for an institution known primarily for its chamber music summer festival, invited me to make a sound installation for the Garden of Sonic Delights, his riff on Bosch's famous painting. Stefan and I had previously worked together when the Cunningham Dance Company, of which he was one of the musical directors, commissioned a work from me for a new dance of Merce Cunningham's Eye Space, which became my piece Jitterbug. Bob and I had worked together several times over the years. He'd made special devices for me, engineered recording sessions, but this time I dreamed of a full collaboration from the ground up and talked him into it. Such a collaboration does not split neatly into creator, fabricator, but rather we drew on each other's strengths from the initial planning on. I on his expertise in sound design and spatialization, he on mine in composition. So I researched and assembled the sound materials, which I'll describe shortly, and composed them into what I call episodes, which Bob then wove through the wooded site we chose so skillfully that some listeners said they couldn't tell which sounds were ambient and native to that site and which we'd planted there, which was just what we aimed for. The low sounds seeming to come from the rocks and the high sounds from the canopy. It was perfect for what we had in mind. Could you bring up the first of the three wild energies? There we go. Isn't that an amazing site? It's the backside of a hillock. Uh, with these big tumbled rocks that we could set the subwoofers in amongst, and a lovely tree canopy. And the, uh, you can imagine our speakers are installed in a wide arc through the space. And the next one, here's Christina Kubisch, who visited in 2019 and took the photos that I took, one I took of hers. It was special to me to have her visit because in 2018 we'd collaborated, sending each other a number of sound samples and from those each of us created a new piece for release on a joint Gruen recorder CD titled The Secret Life of the Invisible. I'd sent her sounds from the installation, so it was lovely to have her lie there listening to it. She's a dear friend, we've known each other for many years. And then about the hammocks. My sense is that if your body is relaxed and at ease, it's receptive to sound and you're likely to listen longer. So I always try to provide comfortable seating in installations, but my ideal has long been to use hammocks. This was the perfect place. People listen for long stretches of time. Somebody listened right through the 20, 40, 47 minute cycle twice. The Caramore staff took to having their lunches there, which is always a good sign, I feel. Some people napped. And as the 14 installations were going up, other composers would hang out there at night, lying in the hammocks. It's been a pity to have to replace them with garden chairs in this COVID time, but the hammocks will return. There are seven Polk, P-O-L-K, speakers and four Polk subwoofers here, hidden in the undergrowth all designed for long-term outdoor use. The sounds are played not from a computer, but from a sound card with a player and amplifiers, all housed in a specially built cabinet, which the Karamur staff fabricated for us. We tucked it away as, as, as much as we could in the undergrowth. 
it's very important to us both that the equipment be hidden, invisible, so that the sounds feel sourceless just there in the space. About the time Stefan approached me, I was thinking about infrasound from a volcano. I had just seen and heard an episode of Nova in which Milton Garces played trans infrasound events from Mount Kilauea in Hawaii, which his team had recorded. He's the director of the infrasound laboratory at the University of Hawaii. I was knocked out by the beautiful complexity of these sounds and I wanted very much to work with them. This is the sound that drew me so strongly. It's, it's number four in your download, Puend. It's sound from the Pu'u O'O vent, which continues to be a highly active vent. This sound is generated by pressurized gas emitted as magma rises to the surface. As Dr. Garces described it, the release of this gas causes pressure fluctuations or infrasound. Gas bubbles, large and small, are involved and can even excite large underground cavities into resonance, just like blowing over the lip of a beverage bottle. So if you wouldn't mind clicking on Puyen. through us, without our being able to be aware of them, being way outside our hearing range. Thus, perhaps sensed, but not heard, but transposed into our range, like that one, they're extraordinarily beautiful, and of course, significant. These are vibrations emanating from sources which affect us fundamentally, many of which are creating the planet's environment, the Earth's crust and core, the oxygen generating plants, everything deeply integrated, forming a web through which we move and on which we depend. So the work is focused on energies in the form of pressure waves, and in some cases, radio waves, generated by geophysical and atmospheric forces and phenomena, incorporating various volcanic vents on Kilauea from melting gases, as I mentioned, hydrothermal vents in the seabed, in the main endeavor field of the Juan de Fuca Ridge off the coast of Oregon, which was sent to us by Timothy Crone, then at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, Columbia University. Solar oscillations generated in the body of the sun and recorded by the SOHO spacecraft from Alexander Kosovachev, Stanford Solar Center. VLF chorus waves in whistlers, radio waves from the magnetosphere and the Earth's magnetic fields from Craig Kletzing, University of Iowa Radio and Plasma Group, auroral kilometric radiation emitted along magnetic field lines in connection with auroras, a SEI, S -E -I, whale recorded near the Hudson River Canyon by Arthur Newhall, Woods Hole, earthquakes from Sumatra, Japan and California from Ben Holtzman at Lamont Doherty and the US Geological Survey, Ultrasound from the interior of a Scots pine tree from Roman Zweifel from the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research and Marcus Maeder, Zurich University of the Arts and the Institute for Computer Music and Sound Technology. Also from Melvin Tyree, a pioneer in this field. Various bats and a recording of a groat's tiger moth sending bursts of ultrasonic clicks to jam a hunting big brown bats echolocating sonar signals, both ultrasonic, from Aaron Corcoran, Wake Forest University. Number five, wild energy with bat moth, <laughs> two minutes, excerpt starts with earthquakes from Sumatra, auroral kilometric radiation, that very high sparkly sounds, a big brown bat, and then 
a big brown bat and a tiger moth jamming each other's signals comes in at o oh minute o oh point <laughs> at 50 seconds and chorus waves combining with quake continuing quakes from sumatra the high hissing sound comes from the quakes and was really nice to spatialize we let it drift through the trees so if you would click on number five please not a simulation or analog. The Caramore location is rich in ambient sound, typically a distant train, wind of course, cicadas, birds, leaf blowers and fall, tree frogs, distant conversations, planes. So we decided to leave spaces between our episodes of up to a couple of minutes for the ambient soundscape to be recorded, to be foregrounded, sorry. It was important to us to recognize it, not just to impose on it, but to incorporate it beyond its presence, constant presence in the background of our episodes. So we foregrounded it between episodes. I composed 11 sections of varying lengths, some sounds returning, others occurring only once. And the piece plays continuously with just a slightly longer silence before it returns to the begin beginning. So in reality, it begins for you when you enter that place and it ends when you leave. But in fact, the cycle begins and ends with the sun, which seems symbolically right. In the last episode, number six, the sounds in order of appearance are Kilauea events, atmospheric whistlers, VLF radio waves generated by lightning which travel along Earth's magnetic field lines, a pipistrella bat, the say whale, trees, the iterating woodblock-like sound coming from cavitation ruptures in their water columns during droughts, myotis and silver-haired bats, hydrothermal vent noise finely filtered at 48, 49 and 101 hertz, and the solar acoustic emissions 
These are acoustical pressure waves which bounce from one side of the sound, sun to the other, creating 10 million resonances, it's estimated, inside the sun and oscillations on the surface, sped up 42,000 times to bring them into our audio range. And ending with the pu'u'o'o vent again, a tremor. Bob and I both hear the beginning of this episode as a sort of dance moving among the trees. In the installation, you would hear a spatialized interplay of the low hertz coming from the subs and everything else from the other speakers, which was a lot of fun to work with.
So, moving to different but related ground, I'd like to describe a listening practice that I love to do. Listening with. Ever since 2014, each year on July 18th, the World Listening Project announces a global call for participation on World Listening Day, honoring R. Murray Schaefer, the Canadian composer who, with Hildegard Westerkamp, Barry Truax and others, founded the World Soundscape Project in 1971 and coined the word which we all now take for granted, soundscape, co coined the word. And perhaps the world we now all take for granted. They developed the fundamental ideas and practices of acoustic ecology and have inspired musicians in infiltrated fields of research everywhere. July 18th was Schaefer's birthday. And in 2019, I was honored and thrilled to be invited to create the theme for World Listening Day. I'd recently started to think that when I go out on my deck at night to listen to everything, to check it all out, I am not the only listener. Other beings around me are also listening, sensing vibrations, so that I'm actually listening with rather than listening to. It's different. Elaborating on that realization, I sent in the following text. Listening with the neighborhood at midnight and again at dawn. Listening with an awareness that all around you are other life forms, simultaneously listening and sensing with you. Plant roots, owls, worms, cicadas, voles, mutually intertwined within the web of vibrations which animate and surround our planet and elaborating slightly on it. Listening so closely to a river that you enter the river, are listening inside the river's flow, becoming one with the river as it enters your body, right here, not separate. Listening to a volcanic vent, to movement from within a tree as those vibrations pulse inside your body and tickle your synapses, thus not separate. Listening to feel I am one with all these phenomena. Can I feel it? I listen to know it. What we're one with, we cannot harm. The brilliant soprano Juliet Fraser organized an eavesdropping London symposium online in April last year with the theme, Creative Activism, Radical Responses Within New Music, in which I was a panelist and I talked about listening with. One of the participants asked if I could, to quote, recommend specific acts of listening in our homes, end quote, during the lockdowns we're enduring now, a sort of mini guidebook for home listening. So I got together with friends and we assembled a little guidebook for home listening with scores and texts from Ruth Anderson, Sam Owinger, Katrin Emler, David Behrman, Bruce Odland and Liz Phillips. Juliet posted it online and you can still download and share it free. Go to www.eavesdropping.london slash symposium. Then go to season two, 25 and 26 April, 2020. Scroll down through the day two, session four details to the PDFs and there you'll find it. Thank you. Now, I'd love to hear your questions. Hi again, Anea, I hope you can see me. Thank you so much. That was really lovely. Um, as I said, we so appreciate you coming to present and talk about your work. It's really fantastic. I hope everyone was able to listen to the clips as we were all collectively listening. That was a really good way around um, thanks, Michael, for setting that up because it was really nice to hear it in kind of full fidelity. All right, so um, I suggest we take a short break before we start with the Q&A and it will give everyone time to refresh themselves and maybe reflect, decide what questions they want to ask Anea. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will start with the student group um who will start the q a and then we will um widen it up to the rest of the audience um for anyone else who wants to ask and they have some questions so i make it 324 
um, soon, 3.25. So shall we meet back? What are people saying? Is five minutes a good length of a break this week? So, okay, so let's yeah. meet back in five minutes time at 3.30 UK time or half past the hour, wherever you are. Um, if you wish, you can use the away function, which is if you go to the bottom left hand icon at the bottom of the screen, my status, and you can use the away function, which will just um, pause you until you're ready to come back. Lovely. Right. So see you all in five minutes. OK. Hi, Lauren, nice to see you. Hello. <laughs> um, great. Hello. So, yeah, just a reminder that if you would like to ask Anne a question, we encourage you if your internet connection allows it and if you feel comfortable to turn on your camera. It's always nice to see some faces in the world of online teaching. Um, so, yeah, Kathy is around also to kind of co facilitate the QA um, or chime in as you wish, Kathy. So, first, We'll hear from the student um, group, I think, led by Lauren. Great to have you, Lauren. Um, and I've also, if any of the other people in the group I've missed, just put their hand up, I can make you presenters as well. Um, but why don't you kick us off, Lauren, and then if the others from the group want to join in, they can do so as well. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you so much Hello, for your It's really, really beautiful. Um, I'm I just have no words to say. I was just so amazed by all the sounds that I was listening to. Um, so my question that I have for you is, I've written it down because I choke on my words and forget to say things properly. So I'm just gonna read out <laughs> what I've written. Um, I'm particularly interested in both field recordings and being able to record, record sounds that are otherwise inaudible. I was introduced to Christina Kubisch and the telephone pickup mic when I first started this course, which had a lasting impact on my work. Are there any other techniques or processes that you could recommend for capturing inaudible sounds to a student who doesn't have a student that doesn't have access to expensive high tech equipment? <laughs> I don't either. Oh, <laughs> it's not for capturing in for an ultrasound, of course. Um, I, I think my, my recommendation would be because it's based very much on my own way of working would be to, to um, just cruise online, uh, listening to all manner of uh, environmental um, phenomenal sounds from various research uh, sources, uh, many of which end up on SoundCloud, and, and find the ones you really love and would love to work with, and then just start communicating with the, the uh, group of scientists or the um, people who who generated uh, those sounds, who put them up online. And from there, you can go deeper and uh, ask them further about their research, and they will very often send further sounds, um, and it sort of expands. But that would be my recommendation. I mean, when I try to think about <laughs> the equipment involved in capturing volcanic sounds, yeah. it's just. <laughs> I know, I was just like, how are you guys thinking? <laughs> um, are there... but, but, Sorry, sorry, carry on. Yeah. But, um, but, but as I said, I found scientists wonderfully generous and responsive invariably. So it's a friendly, it's a friendly environment to put your toe in. Cool. And is there anything you can recommend? So if, if I was to go out of my handheld recorder, like what sort of things would you recommend experimenting to record within the natural world? Sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, my collection is for close-up recording because of the detail, my, my fascination with detail. So the sorts of sounds I find myself recording mostly are sounds which I can get close to. Um, uh, but I've also lately been, uh, well, over, over a long period of time, every now and then I, I set about recording a, a, um, a whole soundscape as much as I can. Um, I wouldn't, I would recommend you just go after the sounds that fascinate you. Go out, sit quiet for a, quite a long period of time. Um, Pauline Oliveros's meditations concerned with 
expanding one's hearing so that one hears everything are a wonderful uh, practice with which to begin a recording session. Just go sit quiet, listen until you think you're hearing everything, and then find what really fascinates you and see. And, and my way of working, I try to then I try to get close to it, um, which makes it easy with rivers and hard with animate, uh, you know, mammalian phenomena. <laughs> um, and and start recording and record for long stretches of time. And there's always that that tricky catch whereby you switch off your recorder and then the sound you were most hoping to hear pops right up immediately <laughs> so, and you lose it or with any luck it continues and you can you can nab it but that that constantly happens but but give it a long stretch of time good recording okay. length five minutes often doesn't do it you never know what's going to happen you know so. okay thank you thank you for that um should i someone Lauren? Who's, sorry there's so many messages coming outside who is coming to talk me don't worry about it lauren i think you can continue uh, um i was wondering because i haven't heard anything from anyone in my group should i read the questions off the padlet sure yeah do you want to choose some and kathy do feel free to chime in at any point if you like or indeed anyone else um louise and Irene, I know you're here too. So yeah, if you... anyone else has any any questions, like feel free to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a different kind of experts within the staff as well. I'm sure who might. Yeah. I I'd just like to jump in for a moment, just following on from Lauren's question, if you don't mind, Lauren, and then then go back to the Padlet. <laughs> um, yeah, because I'm interested in you know you, you've talked a lot before. Uh, about the sort of uh, you know standing in the river with your microphones and um, you know that, that kind of very physical engagement with recording and um, which involves you know the so many things the journey the memory of the time etc and I was wondering how different your relationships felt with the sounds that you have used that are recorded by other people from the sounds that you use recorded by yourself yeah. you know does there feel like a significant difference in the relationship you have well it it is a significant difference um and yes i've caught myself wishing i could actually do the recording <laughs> at whatever frequency level <laughs> levels the phenomena is, is expressing itself so to speak um but i've over time i've, I've done that several times i mean way back in tiger bomb uh, there was no way i was going to be able to record a couple of tigers mating but <laughs> the bbc archives contained such a recording which was amazing so um it was fine I, I felt fine about appropriating them those tigers um i i don't it, it it's not a difference which plays a significant role in how i work with them i think kathy because mm -hmm. ultimately they are all in the common ground of being these amazingly alive energy flows fluctuating energy flows manifesting as sound um, which catch me up in their energy, and that's what I'm working with. So it's not as significant a difference as one might think. And think, and, and it's amazing we have access to these sounds. No, such a wide access these days. It's just astonishing. We're lucky. Yeah. But no, absolutely. Go on. Sorry. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to say, absolutely incredible, and I wish we all had access to hearing what you've done with them in <laughs> Carol. I mean, it just makes, I don't know about everyone else, it just makes me want to go there now. <laughs> it's a wonderful sight. <laughs> I love it. Felt very lucky to be able to do that. Lucky to be able to work with Bob, who is extraordinary and so such a wonderful imag sonic imagination and lucky to be able to do what we wanted in that site. Um, yeah, Stefan knew what, just what we'd go to, go for. Stefan, that was the second site. The site I showed you was actually the second site we set up at Caramore. 
um, you know, all the installations came down at the end of 2014. And then a couple of years later, we were invited to come back and recreate wild energy. And Stefan Moore walked us right to that spot. He knew he knows us both well. He knew we would go for it. And we said, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> wonderful sight. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I hand back to you, Lauren? Yes. So let me just get the padlet up. Um, okay. So there is a question here from Vlad who said, how did the Second World War and its aftermath influence your development as an artist? <laughs> it, it really did significantly. I, I, I went through it in New Zealand. I was born when it started in 39. I, I experienced my parents' fears around the war down the South Pacific. We had a number of fears, but but especially my mother's, who came from South. She was from Southampton, and her parents were were lived through the war and the rest of their lives in Southampton. She couldn't get to them, um, and and her feelings, while she didn't express them so often, I mean, I imbibed them so right through my 20s until I looked at myself and said, I've got to get out of this. I was, um, I had a sort of dark imagination. Um, and I, I remember being uh, reading Kafka for a number of years. I, I, I've read widely on the Second World War, widely on, on the camps, um, and made a couple of pieces based on those my feelings and, and responses. Finally, I just had to sort of move out of that, but it had a, a deep effect, as it as it has on everybody, you no, know, in course. the especially in the UK. Yeah, there were still bombed out sites in London when I when I arrived in sixty one, just as there were bullet pot marked and and and. Uh, disintegrating buildings in Serbia and Croatia when I was going down the Danube in Vilja in in Croatia yeah you see war doesn't disappear its vestiges don't disappear fast no not any of them. okay um, <laughs> I'll move on to the next question thank you for your, your answer to that um how important is it to supply contextual information when trying to convey a place through sound. Do you think of your recordings and compositions as precisely accurate depictions of locations they are from, or more abstract representations of the general atmosphere of the place? Uh, I sort of do, do both. I, no, I don't think of my recordings as precise depictions for one thing wonderfully with the river of course it changes it changes minute by minute really in its details i mean it's constantly changing phenomenon um so to 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 uh, pinpoint a question which arises from your own question do i consider the sound maps documentation of those rivers absolutely not i mean any one of those sites will sound very different uh a day later than when I recorded it, or different enough for you to notice the difference, let's say, very different in exaggeration, but, but sometimes it's it's very different. Um, these are not phenomena that stand still, so to speak. So, uh, so my recordings are, are partial depictions of what that site taken, recorded from that angle amongst those trees standing by the river on that day, on that time, gave me and that's all you know um your and you the question opened out into the atmosphere some some of the time i'm recording in close up some of the time i want to capture a sense of the of the whole little local environment where i am um and and so i sort of open up the recording field as it were the sound fields that i'm the way i'm working with the sound field to try to capture everything I can within that location. I go between the two, depending on what's significant to me about the location, really. I mean, at one point, which was a real challenge, working on the Danube in Romania, 
Um, I was sitting by the river. There was a horse cropping grass behind me, which I hadn't expected, which was wonderful uh, for a reason I'll explain in a moment. There were boys jumping in the river on the other side. The river was very broad and exclaiming at how cold it was. There were a couple of girls standing by the river just talking to each other and birds all over the place. And the horse was significant and I wanted to capture it all. Um, and it was, uh, did you say anything? It was a very soft environment. So it was a real challenge both to work with subsequently and to record. But the horse was significant because it creates a focal point, an audio focal point in that environment. And so, and that's always important to me that there be a point of focus. Um, for some reason, uh, it, it, it concretizes a sense of place, I think helps to concretize a sense of place. It, it pulls the focus of that very um, broad soundscape in, into a point you can, you can concentrate on and from which you can expand. Foregr foreground is important. It, it really ends up to foreground being, being an important element, highly, most important element. Diffused soundscapes, I'm not very good at. <laughs> not my fault. <laughs> Don't capture them well necessarily. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I'm interested in the phenomenon, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I said it makes sense. The natural world is very unpredictable. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that um, horse was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. um, it's so interesting, Lauren and the other students, because last week, just to explain to Ania and Kathy, we had. Um, a guest, Katie Hopkins, who is a sound editor who's worked on many BBC Natural World documentaries, Blue Planet and that sort of thing as a sound editor. And she um, talked us through yeah, some of her working process and how she um, has to kind of very realistically match the sound to the image that she's kind of provided with for these documentaries. But it's a very meticulous process and, you know, the time of day, the time of year, you know, the, the type of animal, the call, all this has to be completely correct. But it is kind of reconstructing um, for the image, um, a kind of convincing and yeah, really well, it was very convincing when she played us um, excerpts from it. Um, version of that natural soundscape and then what you're doing and describing is a lot more I guess contingent on what happens the horse chewing the grass and so forth um, but you're not you know it's not guided by an image which I think is quite interesting to to contrast here it's it's almost what we have to we have to reflect on what that listening is itself I mean it's a very different endeavor but I think that's a interesting contrast especially for those who were here last week yeah it's interesting to hear about it and what a what what tremendous craft is involved yeah. in what you're just my word uh, yeah yes. very much so it was yeah. really impressive as for sound and image i prioritize sound every time sorry I'm always hoping people start conjuring up an image of place just from listening, perhaps. Perhaps. Can you hear me? Is my connection bad? Yes. Um, your video disappeared for a second, but you sound fine. So I think it's okay. I think it's okay, Lauren, yeah. Okay. Um sorry, I didn't mean to repeat. <laughs> um so there is a couple more questions on the padlet that I can ask, or if there's anyone else that would like to ask any questions. Feel free to interrupt. Should we? Yeah, I mean, we can. What we can do is allow people to put their hands up now, and if if there isn't, then we can go back to the padlet. How does that sound? Um, if anyone's got any questions for Anaya, please just put up your hand. Louise, go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello, Louise. Yes. Thank you. That was such a great. Great talk. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you the most bog standard question possible. And that is that if you were taking me from my first hydrophone recording lesson, what would you tell me that constitutes a good sound or quote unquote a bad sound? Oh, 
tricky. Well, a bird sounds easier if you if uh, if you hear all sorts of um, movement noise coming from the equipment, particularly from the cable, the mic cable. They're susceptible to to um, wind and uh, once you're the cables above the surface and and your own movement below the surface that ruins the recording as far as I'm concerned right off the bat. Uh, what constitutes good sound? It can vary, Louise. I'm I'm always most interested when my hydrophone seems to land up close to uh, a water beetle or some inhabitant of that that environment, um, and I can hear distinct signals coming from from that that creature, uh, or even from the movement of waterweed. Uh, as long as my mic isn't right in the middle of it and the weed isn't brushing against the mic. Um, but all, but other times, the sense of the, the whole little sonic environment around the mic as a whole is a lovely thing to capture. Good Thank sound, you. of course, is when you get what you're aiming for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alex, did you want to ask a question? Do feel free to turn on your camera if you wish. Oh, sorry, one second. I'm just having an issue with it. Uh, oh, no, no, no pressure. Okay, I don't think I don't think the camera's done. Come on. No worries. We can hear you though. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, hi, Inea. Thank you so much for your Hello. talk. It's been really an honour to hear you speak. Um, I was just kind of thinking about um, the question about um, World War II and its effect on your practice. Um, and I was kind of led to consider, we see a lot of comparisons about um, the effects of World War II on society being similar to those of the pandemic. And I was wondering if there are any parallels um, that you could draw or maybe differences between the ways in which the two kind of um, biggest world events in kind of human history might kind of have affected your practice, um, yeah, like parallel to each other. Um, or aside from that, if there's anything else, um, any observations you've made in the past year, we've seen a lot of people talking about, um, uh, we saw a lot of projects, I guess, like last springtime, um, kind of uh, dealing with recording the newfound silence that we had in many kind of urban areas. Um, so I just wonder if you have any reflections on that, how it might have affected your practice. Um, just questions around that, really. Hmm. Um, I think, I think because I experienced World War II very much at a remove, uh, since New Zealand was never invaded, um, we didn't have, and none of my immediate relatives were caught up in, in the fighting. Um, it would be hard. It's hard. I, I don't think I can make parallels between. Uh, my experience of World War II and um, our experience of the pandemic. Um, that's, that's a huge, it opens up a huge arena, which I don't think I'm competent to, to step into. Um, the, the second part of your question about the, uh, which I think was concerned with the, really focused on the quietude that we're experiencing, this, the solitude often in quietude and and its effect on people's people's work is that am I, is that right alex yeah that, that I right? pretty much sums up what i was getting at yeah oh well <laughs> um the solitude fortunately my solitude has been interrupted on a regular basis by good friends um I, I have a weekly conversation with Louise, which is wonderful, and with Sam and uh, Anger and Katrin Emler in Berlin, which is also wonderful. And I'm fed the most marvelous soups by Bruce Odland and his wife, and so on. So, and Liz Phillips and, and her husband and I hang out every so often. So, friends have been interrupting my solitude, but I have to say, apart from that, Solitude and quietude have been welcome because I've been wanting. I've, I've spent the whole year working on a an electroacoustic piece in memory of my my late spouse Ruth Anderson, 
uh, which of course has has also been a year of absorbing her death so that those conditions have been just right for work <laughs> really and i've been able to work um just just alone you know uh, assembling my materials record i did some field recordings in june and working with those and with conversations uh, phone conversations ruth recorded of us holding back in 73 when we first met so my materials didn't involve collaborating with others and i could just go down to my studio every morning with a cup of coffee and and switch on her voice which has been lovely so um but i see i, I see the effects of that of our distance on on myself and others i'm a hugging person and i can't hug <laughs> i miss it and i i see how it stresses stresses us it's it's very painful to 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 see yeah. well and i'm sorry but but i'm grateful for such an honest and open answer yeah, so thank you oh, you're most welcome and I, i'd like to add that most amazing work is being produced in this time so for instance, yes, a, recent, a recent interesting work on Times Square. Oh yeah, a recent work on Times Square by Pamela Z. Times Square yes, Three yeah, is, is brilliant and and huge in its in its span and and just wonderful mm -hmm. to experience it. And that's just one of so many so many you know examples of work being done right now that are, are exhilarating, in fact, and and really helpful. Yes, quite. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. OK, we've got a few questions coming in now. So um, should we go to Luke next? Luke, are you able to turn on your microphone and camera okay. if you wish? To? I Hi. think I've yeah. got it. Hi. Um, go ahead. Thanks, thanks for the wonderful talk and, and also for that answer to the last question. That was really touching. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I was curious, going back to the installation with the hammocks, um, just yeah. about um, whether you've, um, whether, I guess, what the sort of longer term impact on that environment has been putting sound into it, um, whether people are sort of studying that or looking at that, or especially with natural sounds kind of going back into the environment being played out over speakers over a long period of time. I'm really curious just as to whether I guess whether somebody or whether you're sort of monitoring the environmental effects of that and, and what they might be. We haven't been monitoring the, them, but we have been wondering about them. Oh, uh, I'm not sure that we, we would know quite how to monitor them. What has specifically interested us um, has been uh, whether it affects bird populations, little very localized uh, mm -hmm. bird populations whether we have disturbed them, which we very, and bats too, for that matter. I mean, all the local fauna, um, whether we've disturbed them or whether they have become habituated to these rumbles coming up out of the ground every so often, for example, or, or sounds zinging through high frequency bands. Um, and we haven't been able to tell, it doesn't, on, on, on just a sort of very loosely based observation, it doesn't seem to me that there's less bird song there that, is, that we've inhibited. I hope we haven't, but it doesn't seem to be less than there was before we uh, actually started the sound running. Um, and I have to confess it, uh, it runs continuously when it's on because uh, largely because it's such a, a burden on the, it will be a burden on the staff to switch off and switch on mm. on a regular basis. And so it just runs. Um, but, and I, I would very much like to know uh, whether we have affected the local, you know, ecology. Um, but I don't know how to go about ascertaining that. Great. I wouldn't know either, but I was just curious. Um, it's it's really interesting to think about that. So thank thanks for your answer. That's great. One thing I have noticed is that a lot of local people use Caramore's grounds, which are very beautiful, as as a, a a place for just walking. 
um, they're big and they're absolutely lovely and they're wild areas. And our installation's in one of the wilder corners of the estate, and people keep drifting in and out of it. And 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 every now and then I find someone there and we chat, and they say, "Oh, I, I've been interested in how this sound does this, that, and the other, and so on." And we've had they've become habituated themselves <laughs> to the installation and familiar with it. And, and it's fun to have those conversations. So there's a habituation process going on with the human inhabitants anyway. Mm -hmm. oh, great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Luke. Um, next we have Lucy. Lucy, are you able to turn on your microphone and speak? Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. I know, thanks so much. I'm such a big fan of your work. Thank you so much. And it's such an honor um, hearing you speak. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm also making music and often using um, field recordings and recordings I've made myself. And um, I just, I, I often um, get to a place where I feel um, slightly paralyzed by a kind of lack of um, theoretical, um, or, I mean, I've never studied academically in sound art um, or even composition, in fact, but it seems to be a world in which I'm existing in quite a lot. And not having a theoretical background um, or knowledge of, of um, or, or ability to speak about sound in a technical way, I, it's occasionally a kind of um, barrier in my creative process. And uh, whereas much of the time I would rather just be completely connected with the materials in a very intuitive um, way, but there's a, but I so I I wondered if you ever had similar um, yeah conflicts with materials when you're if I, it, my impression is you work more intuitively than theoretically with sound, and I wonder how you might balance um, how you work with both those sides of working with sound. I'm, I'm not, I'm not particularly drawn to theory. I think having been immersed in it at Darmstadt at a tender age, relatively tender age, I sort of exited it, that realm and, and started focusing on using a mic uh, pragmatically. Um, my, what I would really love to say to you is, trust trust yourself working from intuition intuition covers a wide field right I mean, it's a very broad term um intuition can for instance be seen as proceeding to to create a piece um sort of ad hoc without having for example figured out a, um, a rough structure for the piece uh, before embarking on it. I'm all for doing, uh, I'm all for, uh, I work both ways, but I'm all for do is starting embarking on a piece, um, not from a theoretical standpoint at all, but from, from being deeply drawn to the actual, actual sound the piece is going to start with, what that sound feels like. And I, I, I very often um, do electroacoustic pieces on the basis of um, what does this sound need, which is actually the question I put to myself, which is then becomes what other sounds I can access will be compatible with it. How will they affect it? How will they affect each other? And continue, I continue working that way for a while until I can begin to see a shape coming. And then I always feel as if, and and, and of long long felt this the piece tells me what shape it wants um trust trust the sound to tell you what to do um would be yeah. a, a sort of uh, yeah a condensation of that but really trust what you might call intuition and it is not opposed to theory at all but i do see theory as a as a retrospective um a sort of looking back over what has been done and and um creating and seeing patterns 
emerge from it. And um, on that basis, one it's fascinating to do, and one does do that. I mean, inevitably. Um, yeah. But above all, trust your intuition. Yeah. yeah. Because then your sounds will, then you'll be working with them in such a way that you're respecting them. You're yeah. bringing, giving them their full life. Yeah. Another, another tiny detail of that is that I've long loved to uh, do what I call let a sound fill out, uh, let a sound complete its life, which I learned from the glass concerts so long ago. Mm -hmm. Just let a sound go, especially environmental sounds are wonderful this way. I mean, having having captured its its beginning or recorded is a better word <laughs> capture is sort of predatory <laughs> having, having recorded its beginning let it complete itself and see yeah. see where it went yeah, yeah absolutely. and that's already working with shape yeah and structure right trust trust thanks. all that yeah absolutely thanks it's so great to hear your hear your feedback thank you Thank you. I, I won't take up any more space in the session. Oh, no, it was, a, it was a, a wonderful question to, to give. Me, thank you for giving me the chance to respond to it. Thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, I'm so fascinated also by that topic of kind of how the theory can come in, um, especially because you mentioned Darmstadt. And so what everything that you just described almost seems diametrically opposed to the I mean, at least what one typically imagines of Darmstadt if one was not there, um, when one thinks of serialism and Stockhausen and, and that kind of rigidity of um, the very mathematical approach, I suppose, to music um, seems quite opposed to what you just, uh, was that was that almost um, a formative experience in what it made you decide what you didn't want to do? <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> But one thing I, I need to say right away that I love that music. Um, and it was really good for me to be thinking in terms of discrete parameters and how they interact and how one structures them. Um, and my, my subsequent year studying with Koenig uh, was fantastic in um, showing me ways to think about structure, in fact, and and value it and I immersed myself in that and learned a lot from it and then but then what was formative you know actually was studying um studying at the built his built open studio which is the studio he was teaching at electronic music at before he went to Utrecht and and feeling that the sounds we were creating with in the studio and actually a number of the sounds I was hearing in electronic in in purely electronic sound sourced music Brian electronic music uh lacked life which got me thinking about what in a sound constitutes the life 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 element uh which draws me to it which took me into into glass but also into environmental sound and music concrete and then kicking off from there um very quickly so that Working at Bildhoven was really the formative, ex uh, I mean, the, the catalyzing experience. The format Darmstadt itself was a, a, was a wonderful formative experience and super important in my life. And I, as I say, I do love that music. So great to hear you talk about this. Um, so we've got some more questions. Um, I believe, Jess, did you want to go next and then now? Why don't we hear from Jess next? Please do others if you would like, or students, um, put your hand up. As, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we right. can hear you. Can you see me? It's pretty dark in here. <laughs> um, we can see you. You look great. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> very gloomy. <laughs> Yorkshire gloom. Uh, hi, Anaya. Good to see you. Um, Hello. Uh, my, my question is a kind of comment leading on from quite a, a few things other people have said, but it just occurred to me uh what, with, what lauren was saying and also lucy was saying is how we as a species continue to build barriers for ourselves we you know we tell ourselves we don't know this or we haven't got the right bit of kit but but of course mm -hmm. the kit we've all got or, or those of us who haven't got hearing loss is our ears and that's kind of the most important bit <laughs> <And> it's free <laughs> but i just wondered um 
if you had any sort of sense of of whether we're getting any better at, at kind of breaking down these barriers because we seem to those of us in the sound community whatever that means talk about all this sort of freedom we have now and the amazing range of equipment we can have relatively cheaply um but we still seem to put up these sort of psychological barriers to <laughs> to exploring the world or we have to frame it in a certain way either it's relax like nature's either relaxing us or something when it's of course for every other species it's it's not particularly relaxed um so i just wondered if you had any right. sense of, of of whether we'll ever get to a point where we stop putting barriers in the way <laughs> to our own listening or oh, i wonder if the barriers arise from from a sort of indomitable human um, instinct towards categorization. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. And that instinct to categorize um, is sort of irrepressible, isn't it? I mean, and it's so limiting. It's so limiting. Mm. Um, so if we can if we can stop trying to place ourselves in relation to others' work. Yes. Um, as uh, ourselves as being in this category, in the sound art category, um, mm -hmm. in our work in the fixed media, which is a term I really loathe, actually. It seems so <laughs> totally inelegant <laughs> in the fixed media uh, form um, and so on. If we, could, if we can start refusing to use, use those terms, um, which is what gets me back to to my attempt to to cure myself of saying that I capture sounds because of the attitude it suggests, yeah. um, the impossibility of it, for that matter. Um, then, then the other barriers of am I am I really doing this well? Can I, am I capable of doing this? Do I have the chops to do it with? Can begin to you can begin to let go of those too. And I am hopeful. I mean, there's so much amazing work being done in just down through all the gen concurrent generations um, of artists right now with sound mm. um, in so many ways it's 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 tremendously encouraging yeah thank you thanks and, and talking tech is talking tech is fun and i think it's like a sort of addiction but it really doesn't it never gets to the heart of the matter. It's just yeah, fun yeah. to do. Yes. And it's useful information. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but the barriers, I think they I think they're coming down. Cool. Thank you. It's all ears. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, nice to see you, Joe. And a talking shop is only part of part of it. Um, yeah. Now. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks so much, Anea. It's really wonderful to be introduced to your work in this way. Um, my question, I think, is again, it's sort of connected to the ones that have just gone before. It's linked to what you said really early on in your talk about uh, this sort of sensitivity that recording and listening through our equipment can give us and i wonder if connected to that you find yourself wanting your work to affect change in others given the environmental crisis and how what's your relationship to that idea of what you want the pieces to do or not uh, let me talk about that in relation to the rivers because it's the clearest uh, area in which to discuss this. I yes, I do. Um, I'm what I hope I've always hoped for with the rivers is that the listening to moving water that way can bring up associations for people. Um, who've lived in, in riparian environments with rivers and streams and so on, which they themselves feel, feel a strong connection with. And in bringing up those associations, uh, bring up 
concern and care for the health of those bodies of water. I've always wanted that. Um, I've never been too successful when I've turned didactic in my work. Um, so I, I, I don't try to do that uh, with my environmental works and it's always fallen flat when I've done it with other works too. Uh, it's not not something I do well. Other people find a way to to convey um, things explicitly while invigorating one um, and and stimulating and exciting one. I I haven't found that, but I'm just that's where my hopes have always for change have always sort of rested. Can I bring up association? Can you? Above all, can you feel yourself absolutely at one with the water? I mean, as it goes through your ears, through your body, completely letting yourself flow into it, can you feel yourself not separate? I mean, increasingly that's a crucial point for me with all of all of this work. Can we can we recognize, can we sense how we're not separate? Can we sense it? We aren't. We are not separate. Can we feel it? And and so if you can feel that the river, you're in the river, you're it's inside you, then you're moving towards that recognition that you're not separate from it. And you're I guess that's separate from it. And go on. I was gonna say, and I guess if one did have such an experience while listening to one of your river pieces, it might lead you then to seek other such experiences for yourself. Yes. Oh, I think so. I mean, one, it's, a sort of, it's an ecstatic experience. And once one has one of those, one wants more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for a wonderful question. <laughs> Thanks, Nell. Um, Kathy, why don't you go next? Well, my question's a little bit more sort of basic and are probably going to lower the tone away from um, talking about, you know, about kind of sort of transcendent quality of uh, recording and composing, for which I apologise. But um, <laughs> you have had an amazing long career, basically, and you're still composing and it's still very... Um, you're still very kind of up to date with what's going on. You're kind of, uh, I just feel that at the moment, I mean, obviously you've, you're a freelance, but in the past you have had various academic jobs at, from time to time. But I was just really wondering about, um, I love that image of you going downstairs with your cup of coffee in the morning to your studio. <laughs> and we're all very jealous, I might add. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm lucky. I, was, yeah, I was just wondering whether you sort of talk a little bit about your kind of working day and really how you sort of, I mean, I guess how you've kept going. And I don't mean that in a kind of a, a sort of terrible, how could you possibly keep going way, but I mean, in a way that to maintain a freelance career for so long, it's not always going to be great. <laughs> it's going to have a lot of ups and downs. All know that. <laughs> so I was just two questions really. What's your work day like, and how have you managed to keep going? How do you manage to keep going when things aren't so good? If you don't mind uh, sharing those with us. <laughs> no, I don't mind at all. My working day when I'm when I'm working on a piece, um, it's my working day sort of revolves entirely around that. So. Uh, my circumstances during COVID, being alone and, and uh, having the house entirely to myself and all this quiet, have been perfect, as, as they were when I was a kid, actually, uh, living alone and, and composing, because I've been able to keep keep the peace, so to speak, in my head all the time, um, in sometimes unconsciously, and then it pops up into my consciousness with an idea. And that's a great luxury. So when I'm working on a piece, I'm just in that, these days, I'm able to be continuously in that space. And I go down to the studio and I work for three or four hours and then I remind myself I'd better get up and walk around. Besides, my ears are getting tired and for all I know, I'm not hearing accurately. 
um, and I go and feed myself some sugar or something and, and eventually go back downstairs. When I'm not working on a piece, um, lately I've had a lot of sort of practical things to do. Um, we have two places and just keeping them going and so on. There's lots of practical stuff um, that pops up. But I sort of miss it when I'm not working on a piece. Uh, I used to miss it very much. I use um, now. I know I can just go back to it when I can, when I'm ready. I'm back in that mindset. Um, what keeps me going? Oh, two answers: curiosity and Ruth. I mean, they've been. <laughs> she was a tremendous support. You know, I was what 34 when we met. Um, and so she's been with me most of my working life, really. Um, and yes, there have been periods when I've said, nobody wants my music. Nobody's, you know, the sort of routine one goes through. I don't have any good ideas. <laughs> what am I doing? You know? um, and, and Ruth would say, it'll come back. It'll come back. And, and it always does, uh, which was wonderful. But also, Curiosity pulls me back. I got very curious about infra and ultrasound. Really amazed that I could listen to those sounds, tap, get some sense of their energy. And the sounds themselves then pull me back, you know, or as, yeah, very, I mean, wild energy wasn't a bad example. I happened to be listening to a TV program and I got, a, I heard a sound that I want. I really wanted to get my ears and hands on it, you know, and work with it. And wild energy started from there. So curiosity is, is and curiosity about working with Nate. Nate commissioned that piece, but I'd never written for solo trumpet. I'd done a trumpet trombone duo, which was a so-so piece, not particularly successful years and years and years ago. And beyond that, never worked with the instrument except in an ensemble and wasn't sure that I could, but but that was already a challenge. And then once we met, it was obvious we had a lot of common ground about working with sound, which was a delight. So, um, and the same with Jan, where I was curious about working with a trumpet and then I got very curious about working with someone who thought about sound much as I did so it was, it's mm. been such a pleasure mm. so mm. those two things mm. thank you that's uh, very that's generous Ooh. and um, also a little bit like the intuition you know when things the wise words of Bruce which we will all take with us is, it will come back it's a kind of another trust yourself really yeah, very much so. Yeah, she yeah. Trust, she had learned to trust herself, and 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 she imparted that strongly. Great, thank yeah. you, thank you. You're welcome, Kathy. I love those sorts of questions. They're so nicely <laughs> down to earth. Yes, yeah. and separation is infinite, but it's very nice to talk about nuts and bolts. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate the question as well and the answer. Thank you, Kathy and Anaya. Um, oh, we've got a hand up. Kiro, I was just about to ask your question, Kiro. What a coincidence. Would you like to ask it yourself? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I can put a camera on. Mm. would be nice. I was just thinking that leads really nicely onwards. I was, I was literally just about to read it out from the Padlet, but why don't you go? <laughs> um, Hello, uh, thank, hi, thank you, Ania. Um, everything you said was really thought provoking. Um, I was. Um, the, the idea of non-separation is quite fascinating. And as someone who's, for you, who's spent many years listening, um, I guess to the environment, to the outside world, I was wondering what your, um, I guess what your, like, how can we develop the capacity to listen to ourselves? Um, and because you were talking about intuition and trust, and I thought the idea of listening to the environment, it's like, um, we're becoming present with the sounds around us, but I was also wondering how can we become present with ourselves and how can we be more aware of, or, or how can we trust ourselves really? Do you mind if I hang something onto that, Kiro? Because I was just thinking in, in the context of the conversation and um, 
you know the kind of I guess the generational gap between something like someone like yourself Kira and Anea and uh, I wanted to kind of ask around the attention of listening um, and your phrase of listening to yourself I think is almost getting towards that and you mentioned Anea that you're good friends with um, Sam Auringer and Katrin Emler and I, I actually studied my MA in Berlin with Sam Auringer so I got to know Katrin Emler as well and I feel like through him I really learned a form of listening in a form of kind of patience and attendance that I wasn't born with maybe due to my short generation or attention span and I'm not even the youngest person you know the, the students are much younger than me but I think a lot of us who grew up with pop music and I don't know whatever it is the internet and various other things there is there is something or yeah the question of how we listen and how that has maybe changed over time or whether you whether you agree that that is a generational um characteristic or not so if i could just add that on to your question kira i hope you don't mind of course listening to yourself yes that's that that's really crucial um maybe a place to start would be do you do you work with uh, environmental sounds as well as um, fabri fabricated sounds, synthesized sound, and what do, what sort of sound do you work with? Yeah, um, well, my I guess my background is like classical music, but in the past few years, I've um, I've been quite interested in in taking sample, well, record field recordings of of, of people talking or of animals, of, of the sounds of the sea, and I sort of integrate that in into the sort of music I make. So yeah. Yeah, much much like me, in fact. Hmm. Uh, my my real answer is is listening to yourself in is uh, comes from and uh, can come from observing from paying attention to yourself uh, in the sense of. Uh, what sounds you draw when you're drawn towards a sound strongly um going with that going with that attraction uh following following up on it so paying attention to to what you're drawn towards and i'm sure you're doing that that's a, that that would have to be your practice already um and very much trusting that how can you work in any other way i mean we yeah. all work Sound that we're, we're strongly drawn towards. It's a matter of catching yourself at the moment in which that happens, really, isn't it? I mean, it can it can be very fleeting. I mean, you, I mean God knows, sounds are fleeting. You 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 hear something, you your ears prick up, your your audio cortex <laughs> sort of sits up, and and then paying attention to that experience so that it's so that you can. Explore it a bit, follow up, see if you can find that sound again or or recreate it and, and then see where it would might lead you, perhaps as a way in into your question. I don't know. Okay. Thank yes. you, Jeff. Yeah, paying attention to to those those instinctive responses, those immediate instinctive responses that one one gives. It's well worthwhile and then trusting them. And self trust doesn't eliminate doesn't eliminate self doubt. <laughs> it doesn't really. But yeah. I mean, self doubt keeps coming up. But at least every now and then you can pat it on the head and say, "Go away." Thank you for your answer. I'm familiar with you. Go away. You've done this before. <laughs> Thank you, Kiro, for the question. And I think it helps. Yeah, it responded also to my my point about the my my affliction with my short attention span <laughs> to i'm learning a lot learning through kind of hearing you speak about listening i feel it's yeah it's been really wonderful um Can I follow up on your, your observation? pardon can i follow up on your observation you were you seem to me to be wondering whether there's a generational aspect to short attention span. Well, in a way, we're deluged with opinions about us all. 
at this point being uh, uh, feeling forced to multitask more and more and efficiently and being surrounded by stimuli for sort of 360 degrees. We're deluged with opinions about what this is doing to us, but maybe we don't need to take them on. Um, and, and no, I don't think your generation, for example, has a uh, necessarily a short attention span. No, no, not at all. <laughs> one, one funny aspect of that might be the, 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 the coexistence of, uh, of, of strands of work which, uh, much like Ruth's work did uh, at some, in some pieces, which focus on extremely fast switches between one sound and another and uh, la multiple layerings of multiple sounds. And uh, simultaneously, the strand of current work, which is still fascinated with drones, which are, which demand a long attention span, <laughs> again, mm -hmm. as her, her own work did. I mean, these things co coexist, you know, they're, they're strongly in the, in the musical environment, present still in the musical environment. So they don't cancel each other out, not really. Thank you. You're not ordained to a short attention span. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, thank you. It's been so wonderful um, to hear you speak about your work. And for me, I think to yeah hear you talk about listening and I guess recording and creating and the relationship that you have with sounds that one hears through listening to your to your works, I think. And it's been just so illuminating to hear more um more detail around how you create that you know that intimacy or that that um yeah that closeness that um is present in your work so thank you so much thank you kathy um for coming and introducing anea it's been wonderful to have you thank you to our student um q a group led by lauren fantastic job and to our audience and everyone else who's asked a question and participated or just indeed listened um thank you also michael every week for all the work that you do of course Have my warmest that. thanks to all of you for inviting me mm. thank you annie thank it's you Cassie. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure thank you. wonderful okay well, take care, everyone. Um, please join us next week when we will have AGF Antio Graya Rapati as our, as our guest. 